This one's tough, really tough. We're diving into a story that cuts right to the heart of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We're talking about Eden Yerushalmi, a young Israeli woman taken hostage and ultimately killed by Hamas. And what makes this deep dive even more powerful, more gut-wrenching, is that we're hearing it directly through the words of Eden's sisters from a recent CNN interview. Yeah, they're sharing their family's story, their pain with the world. It's brutal, honestly. Just to set the scene, to understand the backdrop of this tragedy, we need to go back to October 7th of last year. That was the day Hamas launched that massive attack on Israel. The one with that horrifying attack on the Nova Music Festival, right? Exactly. An attack that really, I think, woke a lot of people up to the very real danger, the vulnerability of civilians in this conflict. It's absolutely. No one is immune no matter where they are or what they believe. And tragically, it was during that attack that Eden was kidnapped. Can you even imagine? Just the sheer terror of that moment. For 11 long months, 11 months, her family clung to hope. Then, just last month, the IDF found Eden's body, along with five others, in a Hamas tunnel in Gaza. It wasn't a sudden loss for the family, but the devastating end to a prolonged nightmare. They were living with this uncertainty, this dread, for so long. And to make matters even worse, even more heartbreaking, Eden's sisters, Shani and May, revealed they actually received proof of life. Really? They actually heard from her? Yeah, on three separate occasions, three separate glimmers of hope. Can you imagine the emotional roller coaster, the torture of that? To have that hope ignited, then extinguished, then ignited again? It's a cruel tactic, honestly, one that hostage takers often use. It's about maintaining control, manipulating not just the hostage, but also their loved ones. The psychological impact is immeasurable. It's just brutal. And as if the emotional torment wasn't enough, the conditions inside that tunnel. Shani described it as cramped, airless, pitch black. Imagine, if you will, being trapped in a space so small you can barely stand up, let alone live with any dignity. It's difficult to even fathom. Shani even mentioned that they had to use buckets for toilets. It's inhumane. And when you consider the physical toll, the details from Eden's autopsy are incredibly disturbing. They found that she weighed only 79 pounds at the time of her death. 79 pounds. That single detail speaks volumes about the conditions she was subjected to. It's a clear indication of severe malnourishment, of prolonged deprivation. And, you know, even for hostages who were eventually released, the long-term health effects of that kind of treatment, of that level of deprivation, can be absolutely devastating. It's hard to even find the words. And it makes May's statement, her description of Eden as a hero, for enduring 11 months in captivity, all the more powerful. Honestly, 11 months in those conditions. It's almost impossible to imagine that kind of resilience, to face that kind of darkness and still somehow find the strength to keep going. It's a question that haunts you, isn't it? What would I do? How would I even begin to cope with that kind of adversity? And it's important to remember, too, that Eden's story, as personal, as intimate as it is, it's also set against the backdrop of this massively complex geopolitical conflict. You're right. This isn't just a personal tragedy. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict adds this whole other layer of complexity, of weight, to what happened. And it's led to some really disturbing questions about whether Eden's death, if things had been different, could have been prevented. You're talking about the claims that political maneuvering played a role in her fate. Exactly. Because it's, it's just speculation, right? So two Israeli officials actually went on record, told CNN, that Eden, along with two other hostages, was actually part of a planned release back in July. A release that was based on an existing framework agreement between Israel and Hamas. So there was a chance, a real chance, that she could have been freed months earlier. Months earlier, that's what these officials are saying. That's their claim. One of them even went so far as to say Prime Minister Netanyahu himself was the one who delayed the release. Wow. If that's true, I mean, that adds a whole other dimension of tragedy to this. It's one thing to be caught in this crossfire, this conflict that feels so intractable. But to think that Eden's life, that her death could have been prevented, that there was a path to her being home to her family. It really forces you to confront the weight of these decisions, of these political maneuvers, how they play out, not in some abstract way, but in the lives of real people. And it forces us to ask that really uncomfortable question. Was everything possible done to secure her release? Was everything done to save her life? And you think about the family, the Yerushalmi family, going through those 11 months, that constant back and forth between hope and despair. And Eden's sisters, they actually shared some of her final text messages, the messages she sent in those last moments, the fear she was experiencing. It's a stark reminder, isn't it, that behind these headlines, behind the political rhetoric, the posturing, the endless negotiations, there are real human beings 
Human beings living through unimaginable fear, unimaginable suffering. It's easy to get caught up in the arguments, right? The blame game that seems to constantly surround this conflict. Hmm. But Eden, her story, it reminds us that these aren't just abstract issues we're talking about. There are human lives at stake here. Individuals with hopes, with dreams, with families who love them, caught in the middle of a conflict that can feel so insurmountable. And it's not just Eden and her family. Think about all the other hostages, the ones still being held, the families enduring this agonizing weight, clinging to hope. It's a cycle of suffering, a cycle of violence that seems to have no end. You mentioned the families. I was really struck throughout all of this by the incredible strength Eden's sisters have shown to share her story so openly, so honestly, to keep her memory alive in the face of such immense grief. It's remarkable. It's a testament to the power of love, isn't it? To the human spirit's ability to find resilience even in the darkest, the most unimaginable times. And by speaking out, they're not just honoring her memory, they're issuing a call for a better future, a future where tragedies like this aren't the norm. It's a powerful message. And it leads to this question, this question that I think we all grapple with. Hmm. What can we do as individuals? What can we do to break this cycle? Hmm. How do we even begin to create a future where stories like Eden's aren't the norm, but are seen as this tragic anomaly? It's the question, isn't it? And it's a question that deserves more than just a simple answer. But I think it begins with understanding, with really trying to understand the nuances of this conflict, with seeing the humanity of all those involved, yeah. regardless of what side they're on. It's about looking beyond the headlines, beyond the easy answers. Mm -hmm. It's about challenging our own preconceived notions, engaging in this dialogue, a meaningful dialogue that moves us beyond blame, beyond anger. And ultimately, I think it's about recognizing the human cost of this conflict, the individuals, the Edens, whose lives are tragically cut short, and the families who are left behind to pick up the pieces. We have to move beyond this us versus them. We have to recognize the shared humanity that binds us all. Until we do that, I fear these cycles will just keep repeating themselves. And innocent lives, like Edens, will continue to be lost. It's about remembering that for every headline, for every statistic we see, there's a human story behind it. A family, like Edens, trying to navigate this unimaginable loss. And that's what makes her story, as difficult as it is to hear, so important. It forces us to actually engage with the human cost of this conflict, to move beyond the politics, beyond the arguments, and see the people, the individuals, caught in the middle of it all. Her story and her family's incredible courage in sharing their pain with the world, it's a call to action. It has to be. A call for empathy, for a deeper understanding, for a collective effort, however challenging, to find a path, to find a way towards a future where peace isn't just a word, but a reality. And it starts with us, with each of us, you yep. listening right now. It starts with asking ourselves the hard questions, with seeking out different perspectives, different narratives. It starts with being willing to challenge our own biases, our own assumptions. And it starts with demanding more from our leaders, pushing for solutions that put human life, human dignity above political gain. Because if Eaton's story teaches us anything, it's that the cost of inaction, the cost of indifference, is simply too high. We can't let her death and the countless others lost in this conflict be in vain. We owe it to them, to Eden, to all the victims, and to ourselves to strive for a world where these tragedies aren't inevitable, where they're not the norm, but are instead seen for what they are. The heartbreaking relics of a painful past. A past we can learn from. A past we can and must move beyond. It's a heavy thought to carry with us. But sometimes, those are the thoughts we need most. If Eden's story resonated with you, even in a small way, we encourage you to learn more, to stay engaged, and never turn away from the very real human cost of this conflict. Thanks for joining us for this difficult but necessary conversation.